storm. Yeah. Yeah. Is that during yeah. storm? So yeah. it's certainly during storms and when we have overflow or um, not of capacity. Oh, so we've recently approved um, additional funding and upgrades to the Greenway plan, which are going to help with that um, and hopefully uh, reduce it. But, you know, you talk about kind of what your options are. And when we did the meetings with flooding, actually, Mr. Brom spoke quite a bit about this. And, you know, if we're not putting it there, it's backing up into your homes. So wh where's the trade-off, right? When we have this overflow, do you want it in your basement or do we output to Well, let's have it in our basement. Is, is that because there's there's still some parts of the system where the storm and the, and the sanitary sewer are connected? Is that is that why? Because a storm shouldn't affect whether or not we can or can't process a certain amount of sewage. Is that because that there's that there's the storm water is is mixing in with in some parts of the sewer? combined sewers. Well, there's some part I've, I've heard that there's yeah. some parts of the the system that are so old where where the where that's where they mix yeah. and they mix be, during storms. And so it, very it, little it's not really a greenway sewers. plant, is it? It's not really a greenway problem. It's a it's a pipe problem somewhere else in the city. Yeah. So it's there's very very little combined sewers, which are the old ones that mix. But the problem now, um, one of the biggest problems, and we talked about this during all the flooding, is when stormwater is getting into our sewers or our, um, sanitary lines. Which they shouldn't. Um, so weeping tiles in houses that were built or approved, sorry, prior to about 1985 um, in the building code at that time, weeping tiles could be tied in to sewer lines. So all the water that fell on your roof goes down through your eaves trough, you know, beside your house goes into the sewer line. So these great big storms, you know, it's like everybody in the neighborhood pulling four bathtub plugs at the same time going through. And that's why it's overwhelming our system. That's when we talked about the flooding and talked about the backflow pre uh, preventers. The other piece is the weeping tile disconnect program, and it's about us, you know, removing that. So, do people in here live in houses that have sump pumps? A couple, and if you don't have a sump pump, then likely your weeping tiles are connected into the sanitary lines, and that's the water when you have a storm event that's overwhelming the plants. But well, why can't you just fix it? Why do we have to have either or? Because it's in your house. Pardon? Because it's in your house, my house. We can't just go into your house and into your basement and fix it, right? So we have to do that through programs. Is no, your way? Well, we have the system, so there's no overflow. But you said we either have to let it, the sewage go. So when all of that water, when we have those storms, yeah. Yeah. and all that water is coming from your house, right? That's your personal property. We, as the city, can't make changes on your personal property. That's you and your choice. We can encourage you or subsidize you. But if you choose not to, you choose not to. So then all of that extra water, rainwater, thousands of bathtubs at one, you know, the exact same moment are going to Greenway. So what do we do there, right, when they go through the sewer system and go to Greenway? That's where the overflow water is coming, and that's when it's being released. Uh, we have to report every single time that happens. But can't you make, I'm naive, I don't understand it, but can't you, have to you go make in. Greenway bigger it's to not, accommodate it? Well, what can you, what so that's what we are doing now. It is? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we approve funding to work on that. So we are working on that, certainly. And then the other issue is lying with the homeowner, and that's what the task force is looking at, is what are the ways in the programs that we can decrease this amount of water, which is then going to decrease the amount of water back going into people's homes. Yes? Uh, as far as, um, like, the dam, going back to the dam, um, sort of connected, uh, we know that it's been beneficial to the ecology of the of the river to um, to not have a functioning dam. Uh, how much is that factoring into your decision as you process, you know, back to the river, um, you know, having higher water levels to facilitate perhaps moving the community club back to Wonderland and mm -hmm. and those sort of uh, civic activities which we value highly in London. Any thoughts there as far as uh, I I I. I it's a difficult choice, yeah, I, and, and so I mean. So back to the river was something I expected to come up today, and we've had that question is, you know, if you're approving the back to the river project, um, do you have to fix the dam? Like does one interplay with the other? Uh, the answer is not necessarily. So the project when it went out was for either the repaired river or not repaired river. So I would say that they're two separate issues. Um, back to the river is not reliant on the dam repair or Hasn't Matt Brown said specifically that, that Back to the River will depend on the dam? 
I haven't heard it, so if you heard it, then you may have had I thought he said that he said that during the time. I know meeting. that I had heard from people from the London Community Foundation that said it could be either or. So if he said that on his campaign, I don't know that. I think he said he would prepare the day. I've yes. heard that. Yes. yes. So again, if those things come to a vote of council, then all 15 members of council vote on it. So some people do take stances ahead of time and say, you know, I'm going to do this or commit to doing this. Um, this is one that I don't, I don't want to take a stance on because I don't know what the will of the community is. I do have some of my own thoughts. Um, I have, you know, often spoken about my being on council. It's about my kids and future generations. And when I think with that mindset, I think about the environmental aspect, um, you know, the river flow and things like that. So, you know, that's kind of the bias that I come in with is if I'm thinking long term, what's the best long term thing? Um, but I will enter into the debates that happen at council with an open mind, right? We have to go in with an open mind. I believe you need to listen to debate um, and be able to be persuaded, listen to good points. Otherwise, what's the point of debate? Why don't we all just vote and go home? Um, but also, you know, taking my own personal bias, taking the information presented by staff and taking the information given to me by my community. If everyone kind of got together and had one very clear message, even if I was against it, I would go up and say, I don't support this, however, this is the will of my community, and that's the way that I would vote. If it was sound and balanced with all that info. So it's not an easy position. <laughs> um, and I don't mean to sound wishy-washy, and I'm sure that you know someone out there saying, oh, a politician won't give us a yes or a no answer. I don't have one. I don't. The dam was always let out in the winter, though, wasn't it? Yes. It was that only would, that dammed. Would continue. Uh, that would, even if we had a working dam, that would still happen. My husband laughed. He's a bit of an engineering mind. He said, well, I can only dam half the river. I said, well, that would be a compromise. And I can see the engineers at the room saying, yeah. Um, but no, we did only dam it in the summer, spring and summer for recreation. So. Um, budget came from back here somewhere. Yes. Oh, it was in regards to refugees. He had questions about budget. and So budget's actually being tabled on Monday. Um, so we're going to see what's in there. But my understanding is uh, the government-sponsored refugees, there's a lot of uh, federal money that's behind that. It's not a municipal um, fund. What the municipality has done has been supportive of the United Way and private fundraising at this point, and we have certainly helped with connecting people with services. So the federally funded uh, refugees uh, do have some monies that you know they're bringing with them over the course of however long it is, but the hope is that they're integrating into the community, they're in the workforce, they're starting businesses and generating some of that. So I don't know if that answers your question. I can tell you that no, there's no line in the budget that says for Syrian refugees starting next year. I mean, we should look at it and investigate it. I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been around longer than a lot of you. And I don't like gifts from a Trojan horse. It's very easy for Trudeau to say, well, because he got elected on it, and our visitors are here from another country. I, I'll buy into that anytime. We've got to help them. And they're going to be paid by their private sponsors, churches, and or government. In three years' time, the government may change to a Harper-like government, which is going to mean that they're going to dump on us because we're going to be in the red, even Toronto. As you know, provincially, we're in the red, big time. And they got no money. So a year from now, the poor refugees, I, I'm scared that somebody's going to dump on them and download, and the government will say, well, geez, we gave everybody all this money now we got to cut them. You know what I mean? You've heard it before, haven't you? we got to cut them? Yeah, I think... we got to download? Yeah, I don't know that I'm expecting there to be ongoing costs, right? Um, so I think right now what's been committed by the federal government, and I don't speak for the federal government, but my expectation, and you know, from reading media, same as you, and again, with that in mind, that you hear a quarter of the story, um, is that that funding is there to help people transition 
and then people become Canadian citizens, right? And then they contribute the same as Canadian citizens do, um, pay taxes, and they are entitled to the same benefits that Canadian citizens are. I don't think a welfare benefit is going to carry them through if you've got two or three kids. They'll build the monorail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, won't, it, won't, it won't have to carry them through. It carries them through for part of the first year, which is part of the funding. And then, as Virginia says, they're going to be going out and finding work and paying taxes like everybody else in this room. There is not a history of refugees coming into Canada and somehow transferring onto our welfare system. In fact, the stats show the reverse. Fewer per capita go onto the welfare system than, if you could say, traditional Canadians uh, of, of all sorts. So, I don't see it as being ongoing. The funding is there for the one year. Um, I just want to add on to that point with um, the building the monorail. Uh, Canada, it's um, service for like it's service of uh, providing sector. You know what I'm trying to say? It's growing. It's like it's seen to be in the projected years the largest um, industry, the service industry. That's what I was trying to say. Um, and so the service industry is growing, and um, the immigrant families who come in. They are there and they are eager to get working and Canada doesn't just accept anyone, they're very selective with who they choose. So um, they are choosing families and they are with children and they are choosing engineers and doctors and you know, well educated people um, who are normally like speaking English. So I mean what is Canada but like a vibrant, you know, multicultural kind of community for the immigrants I believe like bring a lot to the table. Most of them are family of immigrants who became nurses and engineers. So, um, in my view, like I think, um, with Canada's economy and with the industry sector, that it would really be beneficial um, to, I guess, like view the refugees in a more productive and more positive way. And I think if there are like ongoing questions about federal funding, you know, certainly speaking with our federal representatives would be the way to go there because I don't. From a municipal point, I can say there's no line in the municipal budget that is attached to um, Syrian refugees. So I, I hear that you have some questions and some concerns, and I think you know speaking with Kate Young, who's the London West uh, representative, is probably the best place to direct those. And I know she's very excited and interested to meet with the community. I've met with her a couple of times already. So certainly, you know, putting those questions there. And again, this is an example of sometimes where people pick up the phone because I'm the name they see in the news more often. They call me and I say, oh, that's actually a Kate Young question or a Peggy Sattler question, and I'll help to connect you. So don't ever hesitate to call and ask. And I don't mind, you know, sending you to the right place or making those connections. Um, damn budget, not the damn budget. <laughs> damn the budget. Um, then there's services that your tax dollars are in place to help with that. Is there any other final topics that people sure, see? Sure. Okay, so, yeah. um, last September, there was an outdoor concert downtown. Mm -hmm that uh, was, I felt that certainly at home, and uh, uh, is, are, are, is that something we can look forward to again uh, this uh, September, to, uh, or do they understand it, see all how acoustics work, and maybe certain equipment shouldn't be allowed to be used uh, for events mm -hmm. like that, uh, if they're heard all the way across the city? We took a number of calls, that was like a rave or a heavy music one, yeah. um, and I heard it myself as well. I think we all did. I think it's, you know, <laughs> again, the acoustics in the city were in the bowl. It's at the bottom and the sound traveled up. So it's certainly I let our staff know about the concerns. Um, and my hope is moving forward that they're being very aware of how those speakers are positioned, um, things like that. But we are going to expect more um, concerts in such downtown. We are going to expect more culture and entertainment. That's certainly the direction that... Um, Many of the councillors are going. That's kind of the direction of tourism. London. It's about bringing people, you know, to our city. You know, they, they wouldn't notice it at all there if it was if that power was cut in half. They, it, the people immediately around that would not notice a difference. Yeah. And and, and we would. Yeah. And we I registered that, our complaints. We need to have some engineers yeah. that understand yeah. science working for us at City Hall. I think. Okay. I registered our complaints, and certainly I would push that going forward okay. as well. 
that we're looking at that when we're having, because I think they're great events to have, right? We have the Canadian well, there's indoor country venues music. For that, though, isn't, isn't there indoor venues for that? There are indoor, yep. Yeah. And there's outdoor venues as well, right? That are probably more appropriate or making sure that you do those measures such as your um, speaker positioning and things like that. update at this point in time so um, we have the taxi bylaw a number of months ago we talked about um, Uber being here they came in around August uh, we talked about putting more dollars into enforcement so our enforcement officers could make sure people not following the taxi bylaw did so um, council voted against it I stood up at that time and I said I don't get it you guys say you have an issue and you have a solution but you don't want to fund your solution um, but no council decided not to do that. So at that time, what was passed was um, for our staff to look into regulating transport network companies such as uh, Uber, and that was contingent on the insurance piece. I thought that report was coming out like, around now, last yes. month or so. It was to come out in the first quarter. Um, so it was initially going to come out in February. Our staff were ready to report back. Um, we heard, and that's actually the committee I chair, which is the Canadian Protective Services Committee. The spokesperson for the taxi industry got in touch and asked that it be moved to March. So we did make the decision to move that report to March so that the taxi industry could be there and be represented as well. I'm especially interested because I've seen just in the press in the last little while, some of the Ontario insurers that just in taxi and Diva have come out with products focused on the Uber and other So they're going to take that argument away from you that we can't let these people do it because there's no insurance for it. If the insurance is there, then you're going to you're going to be pressured more on the, on the yeah. people that want to drive this Uber drivers. So uh, my stance, you know, thus far has been about we have regulations in place. We need to follow the regulations. I also, however, do think that we're over regulating the taxi industry. We could probably find that balance that would then allow other industries if, to enter that market in the same if way. If our economy ever picks up, there's going to be fewer people that are going to be pressured to, to put their own resources to work and, and to be taxi drivers. And that's probably what's driving this Uber phenomenon right now in North America. The United States, Canada, we've been in a perpetual recession for so long. People own cars. They, they, they have, they're they increasingly working multiple jobs, part-time jobs. They want to, to put their cars to use for them if they're already paying for the upkeep and so on. If our economy gets back, ever gets back on track, uh, those people don't presumably don't want it. That, they don't want that to be their lifelong job. So they're uh, they'll move on to other things. And, and the, the attractiveness of Uber and Airbnb for another one will, will go away. And and uh, it's the ultimate solution for that is is a better economy where people don't see that as as the next thing they want to do with their life is drive put their car to work and drive around people. So that's probably the ultimate solution. I have to ask, why don't cab drivers, do cab drivers themselves participate in Uber? Uh, mm -hmm. and what would stop them if, if, they, if their next fare was an, was an Uber ride or a cab ride? Isn't that one way to combat this, you know? Uh, for, uh, from their point of view is, is uh, if you can't beat them, join them. I haven't heard that argument yeah. uh, talked about at all, but that's one, th one observation or one question I have is why don't cab drivers start participating well, in Uber then? Because cab drivers don't own the cars. Okay. Somebody else owns the car and tells them how to drive. It's part of it. But they have to, they own the license, don't they? No. Not some do. Oh, so that no, oh, so you, you get some of the big cab companies. They own multiple licenses. So, and our cabs are also regulated. There's minimum fares. That's being looked at and will be reported back in March. Uh, there's certain charges per kilometer. Those are not consistent with Uber. So, again, my perspective has been, are we regulating too much? We don't tell, you know, pizza company A how much to charge and pizza company B how much to charge. There is a little bit of market decision there. I take an Uber, um, an Uber ride is cheaper than a cab. Mm -hmm. I, I've never ridden in an Uber. I believe that typically it is. Um, with the exception of high demand period when they do the multipliers. 
the $1,100 cab fare in Edmonton. $1,100 New Year's Eve with Uber. But I also heard they tripped on their rate at night when the bars are closing. So, yeah. so it's a model. Well, what do people, you know, we're here now, what do people think? Is there concerns about Uber in general? Is it about the company? Is it about the fare? Do you know what you're getting when you, you know, agree to pay nine times the regular price? My view on that is more from the security perspective. Pricing, I think it should be open pricing. I don't disagree with that. Every, a lot of other places, but the market will bear um, but it's that there aren't the uh, background checks that are necessary for the Uber drivers. There is for the taxi drivers. I mean, I'm basically, or other people are getting into a vehicle with a total stranger and has no way of knowing whether that total stranger is safe or not. Sure, and if he had lost his license to drive, how would you know? Yep. You know, for drunk driving charges. Except that it's based on you know who you, which car you're getting into, and it's also based on people provide information around their experiences with that driver. Mm -hmm. So it's oh, a cumulative yeah. thing. There is some that I get in my name. I don't know how much of a demographic in this room takes cabs regularly yeah. or not, but I certainly don't, and maybe I'll take the odd limousine to the airport or something like that. That's the extent of my hire. Right. I'm, I'm more, I, I think the only issue should be like how much of a distraction is it for City Hall for people that really don't take, will never interact with, or rarely interact with taxis or Uber to begin with. So then, you know, and I look at what's the municipal purpose in regulating, if we're regulating the taxi industry, are we, are, should we be the body that ensures your safety in taxis? Well, then why not, you know, home uh, registered massage clinics? Right. Do we have a role there as well, or in uh, businesses and those kind of things where we don't serve a purpose? So why do we serve a purpose in the tax I think it industry? Goes, it goes back 100 years, I think. It, it goes back uh, a long way. But we do yeah. regulate some other businesses. Too. We do regulate some businesses, but again, I look at municipal purpose. You know, should the city be the one that says yes, your taxi driver is safe? You know, the pizza place has a Halloween really inspection, and then they do the rest themselves. So, I don't know, it's an interesting debate. Make it a provincial regulation. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Let them regulate it. Because who regulates Robert Q? Does the city license Robert Q or does the province? No, transportation. Well, it's the transportation Robert Q company. are going out of the city. Yeah, Robert Q is just... No, but they're, well, they're for a higher serve, transportation yep. service. So the point is, sure. what, what, who... who it's provincially regulated. Well, okay, it, fine. So they're, they're, for, they're for higher service. For School buses aren't regulated by the city of London. Well, they're not for higher service either. They're for higher to the school board. Well, that's, well, that's the school board's got to deal with <laughs> It's that. an interesting debate. Like, there really is a lot on both sides. But for me, I keep going back to what is the municipal purpose? Why are we here? And, you know, just because we've done something for 180 years, should we always continue? Or is it time to get out of that business? But the province regulates for higher transportation service yeah. or don't regulate okay I think we're about ready to wrap up I do have my cards at the back and the sign up sheet for my email list if you don't get my emails and then I'll be available for the next little bit do you have these meetings here regularly every three months I try to do a meeting I advertise on my website if you don't use the internet and you want to take my card you can always call into my office and say when's the next meeting and then always here in the afternoon? I've changed it a little bit. I think Saturday afternoon works the best so far. So, yeah. I'd just like to make a comment. I've lived, sure. in, I've lived in Ryan for 30 years, and it's only since you've been elected that I've even spoken to a councillor. Nevertheless, it's an opportunity to be the last Yep, very much so. I mean, uh, I mean, 30 years, that's going through the number of councillors. At best, you would hear from them at election time, and I never happened to be at the door at the time they dropped off their literature. Um, yeah, thanks for doing it. Yes, yeah. very much yeah. so. I'm happy to. Like I said, my next meeting is going to have London Police here. So if you have questions, if you think in the interim of something you'd really like me to have someone here, or if there's an emerging issue, <coughs> I'm always happy to do them in between. But 
you know, I, I'm happy for the position that I was elected into. I truly enjoy it. Um, and my commitment was that I would stay in touch with my community, and this is one of those ways. So I will keep doing it every three months. Whether I sit here by myself for two hours or I have a full room, I'm happy to be here. Good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.